Realtree's Midwest Whitetail is brought to you by Cabela's, Easton Arrows, Frigid Forage, Fuse, Grizzly Coolers, Hoyt, Hoyman Tree Sauce, Muddy Outdoors, Nikon, Ozonics, Redneck Blinds, Rocket Broadheads, RTP Outdoors, Trophy Rock, Spot Hog Releases, Wilderness Athlete, Viking Solutions, and Realtree. Well, thanks for joining me this week on Midwest Whitetail. I want to show you what I'm up against here. I've talked about this drought that we've had in this area a few different times. This is one of the food plots where I was hoping to hunt this buck that we've nicknamed the Lone Oak Buck. And I don't know if he likes to eat uh, horse weed and mare's tail and maybe a few residual soybeans. If he does, then I'm in, I'm in good shape uh, because he'll be all over this one. But if he likes regular deer food, uh, I might be in trouble here. I was going to broadcast Big and Beastie into this, but we have not had rain for quite a long time. So, and we haven't had any in the forecast. I hate to spread that stuff out and then we just don't get the rains to come along. If you put on top of the ground, you need a fair amount of, of moisture in order to get that to germinate. Uh, you can't just have you know one quick hit. So let's talk about this buck a little bit. Uh, this is a deer that I think, I'm going to go back and dig through some of the stuff that we filmed a few years ago, but I think we can go back to his two-year-old year. year. Uh, he's, he's five years old this year as best I can tell. and then. Starting in uh, 2015, we picked this deer up for sure. That's when we called him the Lone Oak Buck because we filmed him first in the Lone Oak food plot. And that was on uh, one of my favorite days of the year, November 7th, I think, in uh, 2015. I thought this deer was gonna have tremendous potential. He came right past the tree stand. Uh, I elected not to shoot him, figuring him, figuring him to be a three-year-old deer. Uh, then we came into last season and I expected the deer to make a big jump, but he actually went from being a nine point to be an eight pointer, you know, pretty eh, average, you know, no, no, no better than an average four year old eight pointer. And, uh, you know, I put him on the list of bucks to keep an eye on because, you know, the, the next year, which would be this year, he would be a likely uh, candidate for us. So this year he's popped back up again. In the summer, we filmed him not too far from here, uh, just over the top of the trees here uh, in front of me. And I think he's still gonna be living in the same area. So I'm gonna count on that fact because this was his more or less of his core area last year and generally bucks when they break up their bachelor groups and settle into their fall ranges they'll go back to the same places where they were the year before so if that holds true i'm going to have this deer right in the same basic area again in fact once i get the cameras out and really try to figure out the behavior of these deer um, if he's daylight active at all i'm going to target him right off the bat uh, he's not a buck that i'm leaving for plan b i mean he's a good solid deer so now i got to try to figure out where i'm going to hunt this deer I think there is still a little bit of beans in here and I think that you know there there will be some through October I'll bet because uh, you know granted there's a lot of roundup resistant weeds that have grown up in here that I wasn't able to kill when I sprayed it but there are some beans in there too but the place where I really expect to have a crack at this buck is back up this uh, lane through the trees up on top of the ridge and we're going to go up there next and I'm going to show you this spot you know, I've got a tree stand there and I've had good hunts in there over the years, but there's some real issues with that spot too. So let's go take a look at that next. Okay, so the stand is right up here to my right. And I don't have a lot of really good morning stands on this farm uh, just because my emphasis over the years has been to hunt the fringes. I'm not a big fan of diving into the spots where the deer are living and, you know, potentially bumping a bunch of deer. You know, for better or for worse, you know, sometimes it hurts me, but sometimes that, that strategy works really well too. But this is one of my few in the timber, uh, really productive morning spots. The problem with it is, it, it just creates a skyline effect. And when you're looking at tree stand locations, you have to think in terms of what does it appear from the deer's perspective, uh, especially once the foliage starts to drop. Uh, right now, you're looking at basswood trees, some pretty fast uh, leaf dropping type trees. I mean, they're not gonna hold 
into November, which is when I'd be hunting here. So it's gonna be bare. So if it looks skyline now, it's gonna be way worse. So let's take a look at the tree uh, over here from the deer's perspective. Like I mentioned, I've hunted this spot a lot in the past, but this uh, last season, I had a bunch of trouble with this. The, the deer would hit this spot right here and they would just see us up there. And I'm gonna have to move the stands to a different tree someplace around here that sets up better for concealment. If you look, if you look at this from the deer's perspective, I'm gonna drop down on my knee and I'm gonna look up at it and you can see exactly what they see. They just see two big blobs skylined and that's uh, not a good setup, not a good situation when you're putting a tree stand in. So I've gotta move this one. As I go up and pull this thing out, you'll be able to see real easily how skylined I really am up in there and, and why even though I've seen a lot of deer here over the years, there's a really nice trail coming right through here. Uh, I'm still gonna have to move this tree stand. Every time I climb a tree, I either have the muddy uh, lineman's rope on when I'm going up originally to put the stand in, or once I get the stand in, then I put the safe line in. It's so important. I mean, we're heading into another season now and there's nothing that you can do that's more important than making sure that you climb the tree and get back to the ground safely. I've fallen a couple of times and you don't have even the splittest of seconds. I mean, it's almost like the trap door goes out or if a branch breaks that you're holding on to or one that you're stepping on, it's immediately you're, you're moving. So don't think that your cat-like reflexes are gonna be good enough. You've got to go with this stuff. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to make this as firm as I possibly can. The most important safety steps you can take is to wear the harness and to use the safe line every time you go up and down the tree or when you put the stand up to use the lineman's rope so you're never disconnected from the tree. Uh, super important. So I'm gonna go up and get those stands down and show you uh, how silhouetted I am up in that tree. For this next segment, I'm gonna dig into a topic that we cover every year, and that is uh, finding the fall ranges of the bucks that we're gonna be hunting this fall. The bachelor groups break up, the bucks shed their velvet, their testosterone levels rise, and then they disperse into their fall ranges. And that's where we're at right now. It's usually around the end of the first week of September is when you start to see that transition really hit full speed. So from here on, the bucks are gonna be settling into their fall ranges. And uh, that usually takes a couple of weeks for that dispersal to, to uh, work itself out. But from then on, typically where you find a deer towards the end of September is about where you're gonna find him for most of the rest of the fall. Some of them are roamers and some of them are more homebodies. But in general, that's kind of uh, my rule of thumb. So I start running cameras about now. Uh, I'm gonna get my camera, one of my muddy cameras out, right in this little gate opening up here and then uh, uh, I'm going to walk down, there's a food plot along the edge there, I'm going to walk that edge and I'm going to look at all the oak trees and we'll see which ones they're carrying acorns and uh, try to figure out from there, you know, the, some of the early season strategies. I'm looking at a white oak tree here. It's got quite a few acorns on it. I've seen years where they're even more loaded, but a lot of years you don't see very many at all on these white oaks. And this one, I mean, there's definitely been you know, some dropping already. I can see some hulls along the ground here. You, know, you can tell the deer have been feeding in this area. And they're really starting to key in on which oak trees are dropping the acorns. And they like the white oaks the best. They'll eat acorns from all the other oak trees here too. But if there's a white oak tree dropping, that's really where all the deer are going to be really focused. And the bur oak is in the white oak family. It's got the real bushy cap and the leaves. They look like the white oak leaves except the lobes are a lot larger and a lot more rounded. So this is a white oak and you can see a lot of acorns right here, you know, throughout the whole tree. It, it's not quite as prolific up on the top, but this will definitely be a spot to keep an eye on if, if I get a buck on that camera down there that's uh, using this area. There's no doubt 
part of his daily routine is going to be to stop here at this tree and, and uh, grab up whatever acorns are on the ground. So I'm going to keep moving and uh, check out some other subspecies of oak that are along the edge here and learn as much as I can about what they're going to be feeding on. This is a shingle oak tree here. You can tell by the, well, we call them shingle oaks at least, but they're, it's a more of a rounded oval shaped leaf. The acorns are usually pretty small on these shingle oaks. And this year, they're really small. Uh, this is a member of the black oak family. Generally, these acorns will drop late. We see them even as late as the middle to the end of October here. So it can be something to keep in mind for the rut if you find uh, you know, this, this style of oak carrying acorns. We have them here. Um, the drought really did a whammy on the acorn production, especially on some of these little shingle oak trees because there's plenty of acorns in here, but there's, they're, they're pretty small. Uh, it's almost like they didn't quite get fully developed. There's no question that our dry conditions have affected the oak trees here too with the production of the acorns. That's a red oak tree over my shoulder. It's got quite a few acorns on it, which is good to see. Overall, the further into this walk I got, the more encouraged I was. The shingle oak that I hit first had really small dried up little bitty acorns on it, but the deeper along, uh, the trees looked a little bit healthier and the acorns were uh, more numerous and bigger. Um, looks like the white oaks are carrying good this year here. Uh, the red oaks decent, shingle oaks pretty good, and I know the burrs are carrying good. Seems like every place I've seen a burr oak has been you know, tons of acorns and lots of deer even standing around underneath them. So the point of this segment is just to get you focused on what's happening in your area. Don't assume that just because these subspecies are carrying acorns here um, where I'm at, that they're going to be carrying where you're at. It's a little bit different uh, every place that you go. So get out, take your binoculars with you, and find the trees that are really the most prolific with the acorns. Because as the seasons come in, uh, unless you've got you know, some really concentrated food sources, the deer are going to be uh, feeding on those acorns. So that's where the, where the action is going to be when the season opens. Uh, next, I'm going to head back to the house, take a few shots, and show you uh, how my bow is going to be set up for this fall. I'm going to talk real quick about the bow and the accessories I'm going to be using for this year. This is the Hoyt Double XL, and I've got a longer draw length. So these longer bows definitely make a lot of sense for me. Uh, I've got it set up with the fuse accessories. And I'll come back and talk about those a little bit more uh, as the season goes on. But I really want to touch on the release that I'm going to be shooting this year. And this is the uh, Spot Hog Keaton. And this is my first year for it because this is the first year that this release has been in existence. Uh, my friend Gary Keaton invented it and he went to Spot Hog with his invention. And now there's a Keaton, Spot Hog Keaton on the market. It's a unique release from the standpoint that you can draw it using all four fingers. And then once you get to full draw, then you can drop your, your top finger off and position it on the trigger. Um, I like to create a surprise release whenever I can. I just feel like it's more consistent. It gives me a little bit better control of target panic than when I'm commanding the trigger. So when I get to full draw, I put my index finger on the trigger and I put the other three fingers behind it and I start squeezing with all four fingers at the same time. So the Keaton uh, is definitely, uh, it's, it's unique. It allows people with shoulder issues uh, or you know a little bit older uh, like myself to continue to draw a little bit heavier draw weight bows because it's easier to draw. It's easier to pull back with that little T-handle uh, on the release. Right before you get to your anchor, you drop your index off, go to the trigger and then squeeze it off from there. So that's, uh, that's the setup I've got going for this year. Like I said, I'll come back and talk some more about the specific accessories and why I've chosen those and how I've got the bow set up. Uh, it'll be something fun for us to talk about over the next few weeks. But that's it for this week. I appreciate you joining me, and I'll see you right back here again next week for the next episode of Midwest Whitetail. And remember to always dream big.